Waiting, waiting. Woohoo! Hi, everyone. Is this working? Cool. All right. So, this is my talk HTTP and your angry dog. So, a little bit about myself by way of introduction. Uh, my name is Ross Tuck, and my job is to keep you awake after lunch. Okay? So, uh, a little bit about myself. I, uh, I work as the API specialist at a company called iBuilding. So, it's a development agency here in the Netherlands. Uh, I wear a couple different hats there. Uh, I'm a team leader at times. Um, code monkey slash senior engineer and uh, diversity hire. You get the idea. Okay, you can find me on Twitter and Freenode as creatively Ross Tuck. So today's topic, it's uh, one that's really important for web developers of all stripes and colors, uh, no matter what framework or even language you're using, uh, specifically dogs. So now I want to tell you a story. I'm not from the Netherlands. I'm not Dutch. I'm actually from the States. But when I moved to the Netherlands about five and a half years ago, I worked for a company where the boss brought his dog into work with him every day. Uh, this is that dog. This is Dopey. Dopey's a sweet little rat terrier. He's adorable, right? No. Dopey's a devil dog. See, the first month I was here in the Netherlands, every day I would come to work, and I would go up the stairs to my office, and Dopey would be sitting there, waiting for me. And he would just start barking and nipping and growling at me every single time I came up the stairs, and I would just sort of like slide along this wall like to get to my office and like lock the door because I didn't want to deal with an angry dog first thing in the morning. I was already new in the country, right? So this went on for about a month or so until one of my colleagues came up to me and said, you know what he wants from you, right, Ross? And I said, uh, my life? He said, no, 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 he wants cheese. And I said, the dog wants cheese. Well, he is Dutch. So, uh, so I'm a little ashamed to admit it, but the next day I brought home a little balk of cheese and I brought a piece with me to work. And I went up the stairs, I started sliding along the wall like normal, and Dopey comes out, starts barking at me, and I like, give him the little piece of cheese. And he's like, oh, you know? And then he like, lays down and looks at me like, you're all right. And from that point forward, Dopey and I didn't really have a problem with each other. So you might say, this is cute, Ross, but what does the heck does it have to do with HTTP? OK, well, I think HTTP and dogs actually have a lot in common. So for example, uh, they're both all about a good game of fetch. Uh, neither one can spell refer properly. Uh, you can't give either one chocolate. So there's a lot of similarities. But we would rather sort of bury our head in the sand than deal with this angry dog that you know, underlies everything we do. You know, we want it to stay on its side of the fence, and we do our thing, and it does our thing. All right? But yeah, we should be busy being best friends with HTTP, just like man and dog. You know, we can do a lot more together that way. So what I'm going to try and do today is give you a little bit of information about HTTP, probably in the form of features that you've already heard about. But I want to give you the complete story. And that way, the next time HTTP does something unexpected, you know exactly how its little doggy brain works, and you can deal with that. OK? So we're going to start off with some really, really basic information, and we're going to go forward from there. And the difficulty curve of the talk will just sort of climb up a little bit as we go through. So it'll get more interesting, I promise. All right? So let's start off. HTTP is a client-server protocol. It starts off when the client sends a message to the server, which we call a request, and the server sends one back, we call a response. Stop me if this is new information. Okay. Now, the request looks like this. It's nothing complicated. It's a nice plain text format, at least until <coughs> HTTP 2.0. And it's just going to be this sort of simple thing. Now, the main thing you should notice right away is that there's a split in the message. There's this metaphorical fence running through the middle. And that's this new line right here. Now, this new line is sort of uh, splits it into two parts. Now, the bottom part, what we deal with day in, day out, is called the body. Now, our job as web developers is to fill this with HTML. That's basically what we do. All right, but it doesn't have to be HTML. It could be JSON. It could be uh, JSON data. Basically, anything you can represent as a string. And I think as PHP developers, we're used to the idea that you can represent anything as a string or an array. So that's the body in general. All right, now this part on the top, now that's called the headers, or as I like to refer to it, the good stuff. Now, the uh, main thing about the, this part is it's pretty easy to parse. All right, the first line always starts off with a verb, get, post, put, delete. And then it's followed by a relative URL. You combine this with the host header in order to get you know, the actual path to what you're after. And then an HTTP version, which is, for all intents and purposes, going to be 1.1. All right? Now, the stuff underneath it, that's all key value pairs, colons, a separator, blah, blah, blah. The main thing you should notice here, though, is that each one of these headers has its own little DSL. Content length is an integer. Host is a TLD, basically. Authorization is an actual DSL. It starts off with a type, then a space, then whatever your credentials are. Okay? So each one of these is a little bit different. Consistency is not a strong suit of HTTP. And we may have to you know, consult the spec a couple times in order to figure out exactly what it is we want to do. OK? Excuse you. So I'm going to go off and uh, send this message out into the web. HTTP is going to play fetch for me and drag back something, which turns out to be a response. 
Now you can see right away, response looks pretty much like a request. Your time to wake up. Now, uh, the main thing that's about different with this one is you're gonna use some different headers, I mean, so on and so forth, but the main thing is the status code, all right? That's, that's the big change here. Now, a lot of people really, really get obsessed with status codes. They love status codes a lot, and they make it really complicated, and it is complicated figuring out what status code you should use. This is the actual, like, canonical flowchart that people use to figure this out in technical situations. But this is more often summarized as a pithy tweet about 80 people have invented over the last year, which goes kind of like this. All right? And in all intents and purposes, this is what you probably need to know. If you're not sure, round down to 100. Okay? That's heretical, but just, just start there. All right? But you've probably heard all this, so I want to talk about something a little bit meatier, specifically content negotiation. All right? Now, content negotiation is this feature of HTTP that's designed to solve a really, really simple problem. I'm going to build an application called the Dogopedia. You can make requests to it, you know, slash dog, slash corgi, and I'll get information about corgis. Simple. Now, the Dogopedia becomes very popular, and then we get enterprise customers, and if there's one thing enterprise customers want besides paperwork, it's XML. So now we need to decide, are we sending back XML, or are we sending back JSON? And we want to do this preferably without screwing over our early adopters, a la Twitter. So, now the thing is, uh, how do we do that, okay? Well, the way most people try it first is they say, well, I'm going to do corgi.json. I'm going to put a file extension in my URL. I can basically tell you across the board that this is pretty much without exception an awful idea. You should not do this, all right? Because HTTP has no idea about file extensions. You know, it just says URLs are opaque strings, and guess what? Corgi.json is not the same as Corgi.xml. I can no longer just simply compare these URLs to see if they're the different, if they're any different. And this is really, really important for things like, uh, let's say I want to compare bookmarks or traffic logs or things like that. It's, it's a bad idea. If you're not convinced about this, I know it's easy, but if you're not convinced, then I would use this analogy. Imagine the URL as the primary key in your database. REST APIs are not databases, all right? But imagine it is your primary key. If I were to tell you that in your application, I'm going to display the same piece of content like in a sidebar, in a detail page, and on a login page, for example, but I'm gonna create three different records in your database for that, you wouldn't let me near your code. You'd say, you don't understand anything about MVC. Get the heck out of here. So don't do the same thing with your REST API. All right, so this is what people tried at first. Then they got wise to this problem. And they said, ah, I know what I'll do. I'll use a query parameter. That's not part of the URL. And that's true. Query parameter in RFC 2616, which specified HTTP 1.1, query parameters did not count as part of the identity of your URL. However, a thousand RFCs later, they changed their mind. And so, depending on who you ask, query parameters do count. And that was actually a really important decision because CGI bin stuff was abusing this left and right, okay? So that was kind of the issue here. And a more practical note, actually, if you're doing a GET request, a query parameter makes perfect sense. If you're doing a POST request, it makes a lot less sense. This is actually valid according to the spec. I have never seen a piece of software that looked for it, okay? So that's enough about how you shouldn't do it, all right? Boring, let's be constructive, all right? I recommend you use the accept header. This is a standard header, it's defined in HTTP, it's supported and accepted, you saw what I did there, everywhere, okay? So all you do is you specify a MIME type. This is a standard list in a registry done by the IANA, and you just say, hey, this is what I want. This is the types that I as a client understand, okay? And this works uh, really, really well because the header is decoupled from the query parameter, is decoupled from the URL, and I would argue this is a separation of concerns. These three things are orthogonal to each other. So let's not cross the streams. Okay? Now, once you start using the accept header, it's the gateway to more power. All right? So I can start doing things like say that I, as a client, understand more than one format. Okay? So I understand XML and I understand JSON. So once I do that, I immediately walk back into the same problem we were trying to solve in the first place. How do I choose which format I'm getting? Now, there's actually about three different ways you can solve this, but the one you'll see almost across the board is called server-driven negotiation. It's very, very simple. Uh, I, as a client, list everything I understand, and then the server gets to pick, ta-da, and it just tells us what it chose for us. It's kind of like a parent. So, we send these things out across the board, and then HTTP is gonna transfer it, and we're gonna get this back. Now, this is response. In case you can't tell, by the way, these things look an awful lot like each other, so I've actually color-coded the top left-hand side. All right. That's because I forgot to turn on screen recording. Now, um, we're going to start doing that real quick. Now, the next thing here is that we'll see, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah, this. Okay, now you can tell what the server picked because it shows content type. 
All right, the content type header is what tells us it chose application JSON. It had multiple possibilities. It picked the one it preferred. We said we understand it, so we have to live with it. Okay, so that's all there is to it. So pretty simple stuff. Now, I'm gonna start zooming in a little bit more on sort of the more esoteric things that you can do with the accept header. So I'm just gonna cut away the cruft here real quick and cut down to a couple simple types. Text HTML, plain text. Now, once I start doing this, you'll find out that I can actually add extra value. I can add extra nuance to my understanding of a particular type. All right, so this is comma separated. These are separate from each other, but I can actually say key is equal to value and sort of give more information about my understanding of this type. And I can do this as many times as I want. They're just a semicolon delimited. It's kind of an odd choice, I know, but it just breaks down like this. Text HTML with key is equal to value, foo is equal to bar, pretty simple. Now, the spec goes through the trouble of defining all of this DSL, like how you do the parameter stuff, so that at the end of the day, they can define one parameter. It's the only one in the entire spec, all right? That's Q which is short for quality. Now, quality is a measure of how much I want this type. It's a number from between zero to one, and uh, it just, yeah, defaults to 1.0. Now, in this example here, I'm telling the server that I prefer HTML twice as much as I prefer plain text. I'm telling it that HTML is my preferred type. And I can use this in order to create very, very uh, nuanced conversations with the server, especially when you bring wildcards into play. Now, this is not like full-blown regexing, it's just a couple asterisks, but you can basically say, hey, wildcard, you know? And in this example, text HTML, followed by plain text, followed by, well, any textual format you have, markdown or whatever. Okay, so straightforward. And then you get the infamous double wildcard. You've probably seen this with, uh, sur uh, with curl, for example. It just means I understand anything at all. And for many, many uh, different types of user agents, this is the final fallback. Your browser sends this as the final one because your browser is actually a really, really amazing file viewer when you get down to it. I mean, it understands images, it understands HTML, it understands PDF, and if you don't understand it, we got a plug-in for it, okay? Probably by Macromedia. So, all right, so then there's um, accept headers. Now that's, that's kind of like the general way they work in a nutshell. They're a little weird, but this is not quite an angry dog that's gonna keep you locked in your office, okay? So if I were to show you this example real quick, I think everybody in the room could read this now. I say, I understand HTML just as much as I understand XHTML, which is a damn lie, nobody wants XHTML anymore, followed by XML in general, and then whatever you got, okay? So this is what Firefox sends out by default. So, cool, what the heck is it good for? Well, I'm going on and on about accept stuff here real quick because accept is a pattern in HTTP, and I mean like a capital DP design pattern. They use it for all sorts of stuff. You know, accept does that, but you also have accept language. Do I want English, Dutch, French, whatever, you know? And your browser typically reads this from your system settings and sends it out with every request. Like, you know, my system is configured for, uh, yeah, uh, American English followed by Dutch followed by British English, sorry. so. You know, but it also does accept encoding. Uh, usually, is this gzipped or not? Char set, UTF-8. And accept ranges does something totally different I'm not gonna talk about. But for each one of these headers, there's usually a corresponding one, a content, whatever, that will tell you what the server chose for that, okay? And so this is used to select between all sorts of different things by default. It's also key to understanding the difference between resource and representation. Now, this is an HTTP talk, not a REST talk, but the concept features a little bit in both. And just sort of give you the high-level idea, uh, in REST, you only deal with representations. An actual resource is like slash dog slash corgi, right? Now, it's not the URL itself. URL means uniform resource locator. It tells you where to find the, the resource. But the actual resource is like this mystical, platonic ideal. It's too beautiful to touch, you know? But representation is like an actual physical version of it. It's like a JSON Dutch gzipped dog corgi, okay? So when in REST, you only touch representations and that, that idea is, is fundamental. But like I said, not a REST talk. Now, on a practical note, it's maybe the best way to version your API, arguably right now, depending on who you talk to. This is a really, really controversial topic in the REST world, all right? But I would argue that this is really, really bad. This is the most common thing you see, slash v1, slash dog, slash corgi, right? But this is just like when we put corgi.json in there before. We are taking an arbitrary piece of information, we are putting it in the URL, and we are changing our identity for essentially no good reason. So. I would argue that you could probably do something like this. You can make an accept header for your application. Application slash VND is like a defined prefix for vendor specific stuff. And then you could simply vary the output on there. I'll say dogpd v1 plus JSON. The plus JSON is sort of this emerging convention for saying, hey, this is based on JSON, so fall back to that for your regular viewer. Now, that's, that's pretty cool, that's, that's handy. Uh, you might say you're munging this up with the content type though, but 
I would argue that this is different than when we're munging stuff into the URL because, well, I mean, the output is the content. The format is the content that is the version in this case, all right? But the cool thing is, either way, you can use this to sort of like say, I want dash v1 for this resource, but maybe I want v2 for that resource. I can phase parts of my application in or out. They can default to older versions. They can have a conversation about what version they want. You know, whether or not this is the right thing, well, that's to be discussed. Eh? All right, but either way, you can go from very old versions of Dogopedia to very new versions of Dogopedia. Now, while we're talking about new stuff real quick, HTTP 2.0 is you know, around the corner, so to speak, another year or two probably. Uh, there is a discussion about whether or not content negotiation will feature into it. Mark Fe uh, yeah, Felding, the guy, Roy Felding, the fellow who coined the term REST, says content negotiation is, quote, a waste of bits. All right. On the other hand, Mark Nottingham, the chair of HTTP 2.0, says, well, the changes in HTTP 2.0 might make content negotiation finally interesting again. Now, it depends on ultimately what the goal is of HTTP 2.0. I have not read the latest draft. We'll have to see how that turns out. Nonetheless, you'll be dealing with 1.1 for a really long time to come, so it is important that you understand you know, where this comes from. All right. So with that in mind, I'd like to talk about a topic that is seemingly unrelated, the very header. Now, very is uh, an interesting thing. Uh, I've worked with guys who have been in this business for a lot longer than I have, and many of them are, when you ask what the very header does, they get a little hand wavy. They're not completely sure, you know? Um, and you usually just get like, well, the very header, don't touch it. It's, it's kind of bad news. It sort of has a bad reputation. I want to talk about why that is. But first, let's explain what it does, okay? So very simple. Uh, one of the cool things about HTTP is that it's a transparent protocol. I can send messages back and forth from client to server, no problem whatsoever but I can actually plop extra infrastructure here in the middle. I can just put a proxy in. Now, the client keeps sending stuff off to the server. The proxy can intercept that, send that stuff onwards, and go back. This is really, really cool because the client never knows about it, but the proxy can like add some value to whatever this request is. It can be a tool. Like It can actually intercept this request and then some, send something back instead without bothering the server. In its most annoying form, this could be something like a nanny filter, uh, but in its most valuable form, this could be something like uh, Fabian talked yesterday about varnish. Who here is familiar with varnish? Okay, eh, not bad. In case you don't know, varnish is this tool that you can plop in front of your server, and it will remember things based on, you requested this, I have a cache for that, I'll send it back to you. Now, varnish is not very smart. It's very configurable, and it's very, very fast, and that's the advantage of it. It can answer these cache requests like very, very quickly without bothering your server. So it can't run PHP, but it can remember what PHP said. All right. So the problem with this is that Varnish does this mostly based on your URL. And when we start doing stuff with the accept header, we start doing content negotiation, that gets complicated fast because I might have somebody who came along first and asked for plain text. OK, plain text. That primes the cache. Somebody else comes along and asks for JSON, and guess what? They get plain text. That may or may not be acceptable. Okay, so that's an issue. Now, you could say, well, this stuff is all in the spec. It's all standardized. These proxies could just support that stuff. They could just remember what these things are and vary their content based on that. The downside of that is, like, if I'm not varying on accept language, I'm going to create a lot of extra caches for every human language that I don't really need. It's just a waste of resources. But the real final nail in the coffin is that, even though I don't recommend it, uh, HTTP does allow you to actually have custom headers. Now, yeah. What might happen in the future is say cats become sentient and I need to send user agent and user species to tell the server I need to generate like paw print sized click links or something. Who knows? But these things happen and not necessarily all your old infrastructure is going to support that stuff. Okay? So you can boil this down to same URL, different output, what the heck should I return? All right. So what we can do here is I'm just going to say we need a way for the server to tell the proxy, here's how I make my decisions about what I output so you can tell the client without bothering me whatsoever. How do we do that? Hint, it involves the very header. Okay, I am going somewhere, I promise. So what happens is your client sends a message off to the server. All right, the proxy intercepts that and it thinks about it a little bit and it says, hmm, slash dog slash corgi, accept header, user species. I've never seen this request before. I don't know what it is. All right. I'll send it off to the server. The server can figure this out. All right, so the server just makes up some JSON, sends it back. Now, what's different than stuff you've seen previously is the fact that it's going to add a very header here. Now, the very header is going to list accept as the header that we change our output on. You know, we, we use accept to say, is this XML or JSON? It needs to take this header into account when it's making its caches. All right, so that stuff goes on back to the proxy, and the proxy says, hmm, URL and accept. Okay, I can do this. All right, and it sends it on back. Now. 
Sometime later, a completely different client comes along altogether, right? And it sends a message off to the server. Now the server says, hmm, dog slash corgi, accept header, user species. Well, I've got a match for this, I got a match for this, but I don't have anything for this. But the server told me earlier that this wasn't one of the headers it varied on, so I have a cache hit for this. Cool, I can send that back, all right? And it can do that without ever sending anything to the server. And that's how you get awesome scaling stuffs, okay? So that's, that's basically the very header in a nutshell. Now, uh, we're just using accept in this case. It's a very crude primitive example, but you could also add more stuff. Like if in the future cats and dogs go to war, we might change what cats see in the Dogopedia, so we vary on user species and they get different information, okay? So the main thing to remember here is that this is a response header that actually lists request headers. That's a little trippy, but just keep in mind that you're trying on the basis of a request to find a particular response, all right? Now, I mentioned Vary has a little bit of a bad reputation, all right? This may not be true everywhere, but it was for me, and I think there's two reasons behind this ultimately. All right, now the first one is accept encoding, and to a lesser degree, accept language. Back when people first really got interested in doing like reverse proxy stuff, they didn't always know how this worked. So they would like configure it, and then they would start getting really weird bug reports about white pages with strange symbols because they were actually sending gzip versions to clients that didn't support gzip. All right, and French versions to people who didn't read French. All right, well, then they Google for how do I fix this? Okay, very header. Oh, the stupid very header wasn't generated for me automatically because somehow it can figure that out. And then, yeah they blame the very header. So they fix it and then they never touch it again and they tell the next programmer, just, just don't mess with that setting. Now, the next reason I think it has a bad reputation is the same reason we can't have anything nice on the internet. <sighs> <laughs> Sorry. But fact is, is that up to till like I6 and maybe seven to a lesser degree, there was a setting with the very header, like a particular configuration that if you sent it out, then IE would stop caching any of your assets on your page. Like no JavaScript, no images, no CSS, and your client's performance would go Okay, so that was less than fun. Now this is basically a fixed issue now. I mean, don't really worry about this anymore, but it's kind of entered the, the sort of oral folklore of hey, very header is bad. All right, but that's, that's kind of the main thing. Now, while we're talking about performance, let's dive into caching a little bit. When you talk about HTTP caching, there are three headers that people keep in mind here. Expires, pragma, and cache control. Now, I'm gonna start off with pragma because it's the simplest. Don't ever use it, ever. It's not standardized. The behavior's undefined. It doesn't work everywhere the same, all right? There's nothing you can do with pragma you can't do with other headers. If you use pragma, I will find you and I will cut you. All right, so just take it off the list. So, that leaves expires and cache control. Now, expires came about in HTTP 1.0, cache control came out in 1.1. I like to call this the men in black comparison. You know, this is the old busted, this is the new hotness. If new hotness can actually be 15 years old, but anyways. So, cache control right here, uh, they work very, very similarly for your most common use case, okay? So for expires, you just define a particular point in time after which you need to ask the server for a new one here. So if you're on February 6th, this would tell us, hey, you don't need to ask for a new version until February 7th. You can just load it off of your browser's cache. Easy peasy, all right? The downside to this is this date-time format. It's supposedly a like rather tricky to actually get right, and it's not in a surprising number of like standard date time libraries. And if you get it wrong, like you use the two letter version of the day instead of the three letter, then the behavior is completely undefined. It will vary between every combination of proxy and router and you name it between here and the server. You will not find out what's going wrong, okay? But it is still pretty valid, and expires is mostly used today as the easiest version of cache busting because you can say expires negative one and boom, it's out. Now, cache control, on the other hand, is a lot easier to read and generate. Uh, here you say cache control, and then max age equals 120, and that's the number of seconds this is valid for. This is valid for 120 seconds. That's just the programmer in me, but this is a lot easier to generate. It's a lot easier to read. All you have to do is like read in the number of seconds and then just like count down till we can go forward. Cool. All right, so that's expires and cache control in a nutshell. Now, cache control is defined later, and it always has precedence over expires. Now, I'm not telling you don't use expires. The spec says you should send both. But when you send both, well, cache control is still the only one that's read. Um, and there are some pieces of software, I think Squid was the most notable one for a while, that said, uh, well, we only support HTTP 1.0, but most of those actually secretly have support for cache control as well. So 
I don't know. If you're going to send both, though, by all means, but I would say write your cache control like helper or something, and then have it also generate the expires like one time in a piece of library code. Don't like just go set it by hand everywhere. You're, you're going to get it wrong at some point. Okay. Now, if that's all cache control could do, that would be kind of handy, but it wouldn't be a big deal. Well, the great thing about cache control is it has support for a lot more directives. That's why it has this funny like key value syntax again. It's comma separated this time instead of semicolon. And you might be thinking, why is there no dash between S max and age, for example? Uh, well, actually, that's another inconsistency in the spec. But the point is, in this case, for example, I can say max age for browsers and S max age, shared max age, for you know, shared caches like uh, Varnish. So there's a lot more of these, actually, that really give you a lot of control. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I couldn't possibly. All right? The one I will touch on real quick is almost nobody uses it, but the difference between no store and no cache. No store does what you think no cache does. All right? No cache says, don't cache it in like Varnish or shared proxy somewhere, whereas no store says, make no copies even on the browser for like, you know, really, really sensitive banking information. There's actually a discussion about whether or not, because this mistake is so common, about should like, we just change no cache to have the same semantics as a no store? It's a valid effort. I don't know if it'll go through, but then all the old software will still only support the old version, but you think you fixed it because you actually use no cache. And I don't know. We'll see. But regardless, don't worry about copying this down. It's at the end of the slides. But uh, I would say read this guy. This is Mark Nottingham. He's the chair of the HTTP 2.0 committee, like I said. He's much, much smarter than I am, and he's written this fantastic guide to everyday caching with HTTP. This is really something you should read, all right? And it's, it's very down to earth. But with that in mind, I want to go off and talk about something different again here, conditional requests. Or as this part of the talk is usually known afterwards, the part about e-tags, all right? So, when you're talking about conditional requests, then the operative word here is conditional. And I say conditional like an if statement, like in PHP. You can actually do this with HTTP. All right, so if I say uh, delete raw slash reputation if my talk quality was crap. Now, the main thing is that even though the if statement is underneath, it actually applies to the entire thing here. Like if my talk quality was not crap, then please don't delete my reputation. You know, so you could put it in like PHP like this. Now, you know, this is not real code. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's, that's the general idea. All right, and this applies to anything. All right, now, like I said, I don't necessarily support making custom headers in HTTP. Uh, so unfortunately, if talk quality is not in the specification. So what do we have to work with? All right, well, there's a few main groups. You've got the matches, the modifieds, and the range stuff. Now, the matches, they, in the modified, they do the same thing, but they're designed to work with two different inputs. Match works with e tags. Modified does with date times. And if range works with either, but again, I'm not going to talk about ranges. All right. We're just going to stick with the if match stuff for the purposes of this talk. Now you say, wait a second, Ross, wait a second. What the heck is an e tag, anyways? Good question. It's a string, any string whatsoever, anything you want. Uh, just has one rule it needs to represent the current state, all right, of a particular resource. Now, version 14, this is a really simple e tag. This is version 14 of the record. This is valid e tag, 14, done. Now, most of the time, people do this as sort of an MD5 hash. So you'll see, you know, something more like this, all right? but indeed it can be anything you want. All right, here's the catch. It must be valid for the current resource for the current representation. This is the part that everybody gets wrong. Like even Varnish when it came out with ETAG support, they didn't get this qu completely right. Uh, it means that if I have version 14 of dog slash corgi on JSON and English, it must not match, for example, the XML version. All right, they must have two different ETAGs. The reason for this is that the URL plus the ETAG you know, the e-tag doesn't have to be unique per every URL in your entire application, but the URL plus the e-tag will become the cache key, all right, on your local cache. If these two are colliding, then you will have one cache, and that will be storing alternately the JSON version or the XML version, and then you've undone all your good content negotiation work. You must change it basically roughly on what's whatever in your very head, all right? So keep that in mind. That's, that's the gotcha. So now you say, this sounds kind of complicated. And you said I could use last modified date to do basically the same thing. Let's, let's just do that. OK, fine, we can. But three reasons why you shouldn't in my mind. Uh, first off, uh, here's your fun, tricky date time format again. Good luck getting it right. Secondly, it wasn't a big deal for, like, say, the cache stuff, where one second is you know, sufficient. But for here, one second of precision is kind of a long time for some of the use cases you'll see. One second is a long time in computer speak. All right, and then the third reason is, well, basically flexibility. Um, you should technically support both the blast modified and e-tags. Many places or many clients or services do not. They tend to pick one or the other because it's quite a cost to implement. 
I could start off with last modified. People can add support for that. But if later on I need something more fine grained than one second, or I need a more complicated strategy, for example, then I will have to go convince those people to switch over to the other one. Whereas I could have started with a date. I could have just MD5'd it and made it an e tag. Ta da. You know, so that, those are my reasons for using e-tags most of the time. Now, there's two main things that you can do with this. Now, the first one is caching, and then we'll talk about the second one in a minute. Caching is easiest to explain with a use case, in my opinion. All right, let's say I want to build a great big wallboard application to go next to our build server. I'm going to say uh, we're going to refresh a page from GitHub, just a gist, and we'll reshow it on the wallboard every five seconds. Okay, so just sit there pulling, redisplay. All right, so application starts up. First request we do, we go to the GitHub. All right, we get back a 200 OK with a lot of JSON. I was actually really shocked by like how much JSON there is for single request there. Like, you think that's it? No, there's more. All right, so it's quite a bit of JSON here. And if I'm going to keep refreshing for this every five seconds, I'm kind of doing myself a, disser a disservice. I have to reparse this every time. That's a little bit of a waste. But also for GitHub, it's a, a lot of waste for their bandwidth. Okay, so it's it's kind of a lose lose for both sides. Now, what I could do instead is I could take this e-tag value that they have right here, and I'm going to remember it, all right? I'm going to wait five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and I'm going to make another request. Now, this request is going to be the exact same one, all right? The difference is we're going to remember that e-tag value, and we're going to add it here as an if none match, all right? Easy peasy. Now, you might think, why is that not an e-tag header? But like, read the condition. This says, if the e-tag does not match, then do a git request, all right? So if the version has changed, but we're only five seconds later, so nothing has changed, all right? So the server is going to tell us that by sending back something different this time, a 304 not modified, all right? It says nothing has changed. And the coolest thing about this request is what you don't see. There's no giant JSON body here. I already have it in my browser cache here, so there is no need for, me to, for them to actually send it to me again. Done, okay? So. That's, that's caching in a nutshell. You have caching based on e-tags, and the server gets to validate you know, whether or not you should keep using that cache, which can be very powerful and flexible. Now, let's say that we're a little bit further into the future. Uh, OK, now we're five hours ahead, and something has changed. Someone else has come along and done it, but we're still sending the old e-tag. Or maybe just for all intents and purposes, we just change the e-tag to something ridiculous. OK, so we send that off to the server, and then we get back, just like we did on the very first request. We get back a 200 OK, but it's got all the new stuff in it. Okay, so just to recap that, all right, if you have no e-tag and on a service that supports e-tags, you get the full body. If you send an old e-tag, one that's expired, you get the full body, all right? But if you send a matching e-tag, then you get no body and you just load it from your local cache. That's all there is to it, I promise. On supported servers, not everything supports e-tag, all right? How do you know it supports e-tag? Do a git request, see if an e-tag header comes back. That's it, okay? Now. Why would I bother doing this? What are the concrete benefits to this type of caching? I mean, you get a lot more control over it as a, over the server. So like for something where people are hitting the refresh button a lot and you need to know like whether or not they have the latest version, like you know, news stream or something, that's a big deal. But the benefits that people usually cite are things like parsing time goes down for the client, the bandwidth savings are, can be significant for the server, and the response time because the actual application might be doing less work. So it can return the request, uh, return, return a response faster. That's the theory anyways. In practice, I would argue that you're probably going to get some saving on parsing, depending on how well written your client is. But the main thing is that you will save on bandwidth for the server if you're a good citizen and your clients use it, and you have enough cache hits to justify it. All right? If there's no cache hits, then there's no point you know, with 304s. Response time, people don't claim this quite as much as they used to, but it's kind of a maybe baby situation. It depends a lot on how the, you know, the remote service is implemented. Uh, I worked on an application once, a ZF1 app, uh, and I say ZF1 without shame, but I worked on this application where somebody had built e-tag support. And what would happen is you send a put request. Now, they didn't want to build like, you know, e-tag calculators for every controller, so they you, you took a really common scenario here, and they just like MD5 uh, hash the entire body output. So you send a put request then to change something. All right, the service internally sub-dispatches an entire git request to generate the e-tag on the fly, you know, so entire output of all the templating engine, entire sub request. Then if it doesn't match, it goes and applies the put request, and then it changes the actual record in the database. But now it needs to send a new e-tag back to you, so it goes and does a third sub-dispatch where it actually calculates the entire e-tag again, and then it passes it back to you. This probably did not help the response time of the application. Just saying. However, 
You know, the fastest request is one you didn't make. I think somebody important said this once. <laughs> All right. So the main thing here is that if you compare e-tags to like, you know, uh, the cache control stuff we looked at earlier in the application, then uh, this stuff is always slower. All right. Cache control is local. You can just sit there and count the seconds off. You don't have to go hit the wire. But with an e-tag check, you must always hit the network. You are always waiting on the remote server to tell you whether or not it has changed. All right? That, that is always going to be slower. There's nothing you can do about it. And if you have a cache control header that is longer, for example, that is going to take precedence, and you won't even check the server. That's what Fabian meant yesterday when he said uh, expiration wins over validation. Uh, expiration is essentially you know, cache control and expires. Validation or verification is you know, basically e-tags. You know, you're checking with the server. So that is the downside. They both have their places. They both have their use cases. But you, know, you need to keep in mind that if you're really, really relying on this on a scaling strategy, I've seen this go wrong at times. Now, if that was the only thing you could do with e-tags, then I would say that's, that's cute, but it's not necessarily a big deal. What I think are the killer feature for e-tags is this next thing. All right. Now, this is my favorite thing. Wikipedia calls this optimistic concurrency control. I like to refer to it as uh, record versioning, but well, that's just me. All right. So what we do is we send off a request, just like we did before. It's the same stuff. But this time, we're going to tweak it slightly. Instead of reading data, we're going to write data. So instead of doing a git, we're going to do a patch. And instead of an if none match, we're going to say if match. So kind of like take out the exclamation mark, right? And then we're going to say we want to change the description to something Dopey would approve of. Now, if you read this, remember, it says if this matches, if this e tag matches, then do this patch request, OK? So we send it off to the server. We get back this response, 200 OK. And we can see the description field is updated. Yay, it works. So what? Well, what happens if I were to do something, I don't know, wrong, like really wrong? Yeah. All right. So instead of you know, this, I were to send some bogus e tag, something that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, then these things would not match. And then I would get this, 412 precondition failed. Holy crap, that sounds scary. <laughs> you know, but it's not that bad. All right. Remember when we had the pseudocode up here, we said, hey, like if the e-tags match, then we want to patch the record. But if the e-tags do not match, then we send the scary 412 message. That's, that's what you're supposed to do according to the spec. This is like, by the way, usually the part of the talk where somebody who knows something about HTTP like throws his hand up and says, excuse me, sir, but I believe you mean a 409 conflict. Well, that's true. You can use 409 conflict for this. That's perfectly valid. But uh, 409 conflict is like a more general purpose, like semantic. It could not necessarily be this, but it could be like the business logic, like there's a business rule, you can't update this record. Uh, whereas a 412 like concretely says, look, it's, it's a precondition. It's an, it's an if match header or you know, something like that. Uh, it's, it's that. I know which one I'd rather debug. So just saying. All right. But either way, it's your server telling you your e-tag is out of date. I like to call this the two guys in the same record problem. Uh, we've all had this. Like, you and a colleague pull up a record at the same time, and like, uh, you're you're filling out your TPS report, like tick, 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 filling it in, like filling out changes, to everything, right? Your colleague like opens the same record, goes off to get a cup of coffee, talks to some friends, comes back. You know, you click save with all your hard work. He comes by and like just you know like checks one box, clicks save, and overwrites everything you just did. Asshole. No, but the point is, um, this will prevent that. It will say like, hey. When you saved it, we generate a new e-tag. It's a new version, right? Whereas when he clicks save a moment later, he might have started on the same version, but a new one has come in since then, and boom, you're rejected. It works a lot like Git, you know, where you're like trying to merge, and then somebody else has already updated master. But you know, that's, that's kind of the main thing here. Now, there's some other scary precondition errors that you can get out of this. Um, now, this stuff is kind of new. All right, this is like recently standardized. You may not see it in practice yet. Everything else I've shown you with GitHub is more or less true. This does not work there yet. I'll just tell you that up front. What might happen soon is that you make a delete request, all right, and then you start seeing this, 428 precondition required, okay? It just means, am I operating on the latest version? This is the server's way of telling you, I want you to go first and get a, do a git request, get an e-tag or a last modified date or something like that, and then just put it on the request. And that tells me that you took the trouble to go check, you know, is this the version I want to delete? If somebody saves something new in the meantime, you need to, you know, validate that. This is the annoying API version of like, are you sure you want to delete this? Click OK. Click Cancel to deny, you know, that kind of thing. But if you do do that, then the server can just say something like 204, no content, bada bing, bada boom, done. All right? So this was a recent addition to the spec. Either way, just look before you leap. That's what it wants to enforce. 
Now, a little bit about tooling. Let's make this a little bit more concrete real fast. Day-to-day, uh, -day, if you're like I am and just sort of building websites and, and web applications, then the main tools in your arsenal will be very simple. Uh, Firebug and Chrome developer tools. You know, you can just pop these open at the bottom of your browser and you can see stuff about what's going on. It's simple. All right, now you also have some limited control here to like replay a particular request and stuff, but these sort of stop at a certain point, all right? Especially, has anybody here ever worked with cores? Yeah, how many of you have been rendered like, you know, three years older by the experience? <laughs> I know I was, right? Especially in the beginning, because it, it involves your browser's security sandbox. So like when you get something wrong, you know, at least in the beginning, your browser would not tell you anything. It would just, it would like freeze up and give you no information whatsoever. So at that point, you really wanted a tool that stood outside your browser and, you know, did not have to deal with the sandbox. So you have actual proxies, like not proxies like Varnish way over there, but actual proxies on your computer that can record the HTTP traffic you send back and forth. And they're way powerful. Like on Windows, then the de facto one is Fiddler. And it's actually a pretty good piece of software. Now, I'm not on Windows that much, though. So um, I would actually recommend a different piece of software. This is the actual logo. Don't laugh. And the name of the software, by the way, it's not on the logo, is um, Charles. I, I don't know either. I really don't. But I can tell you that Charles is awesome. It's friggin' awesome. All right? It's a Java app, runs everywhere. Uh, it costs 30 bucks, but there's a freeware version that runs for an hour at a time, but it's well worth the money. I would highly recommend playing with it because you can like, modify the requests you send, you can tweak them, you can do whatever you want. It's, you can save entire records. It's very cool. And you can use this to like, play with like, all sorts of stuff that your, your, uh, your browser's sending out. If you want to see some strange things, for example, like try it on a really complicated Ajax website, see how they're doing stuff, Google Docs or Twitter or something. You know? But unfortunately, I'd show you that, but that's all the time I really have for today. So I leave you with a couple words of advice. We've looked at what sort of seems like a random grab bag of HTTP features. But if you sort of read between the lines, what I'm really trying to tell you is like, why does HTTP make the decisions it makes? Uh, why does it like switch between this? Why does it cache this? Why does it hold on to that? I can't tell you everything. I don't know everything. But I'm trying to give you enough of an edge that next time you run into something, you know how its little doggy brain works. You can give it a piece of cheese and you can move on. All right? I will say, treat it like your framework. Take only what you need to survive. <laughs> All right? HTTP has a ton of features. I don't mean a few, I mean a ton. We have, we have not even scratched the surface here, fellas. But uh, if you try and implement every single one of those for like maximum spec compliance in every one of your projects, then you will not get anywhere. You'll never even have time to touch your business domain. So my advice is, if you don't have to deal with two guys on the same record problem, I wouldn't necessarily worry about ETAG so much. If you're not doing things with like lots of cache hitting or supporting XML and JSON, well, maybe you don't need to worry about the you know, content negotiation so much. All right, just take what you need. Either way, I know it can be a little bit sort of scary to like look through the fence, see what's going on out there, you know, deal with it, you know, not necessarily what we want to do. But if you're willing to be flexible and learn a lot about HTTP, then together, the two of you can really make your apps fly. Thank you very much for your time. I actually have a couple minutes real quick, so before I take questions, if there's any, uh, some resources I'd really like to highlight. HTTP BIS is a rewrite of the HTTP spec. It's easier to read, it simplifies a lot of things, it clarifies a lot of vague points. Uh, section two in particular, highly recommend you read it. It's, it's uh, great on the toilet stuff, all right? <laughs> Redbot is also by Mark Nottingham. I really love that guy, man crush. Um, and it's like an HTTP linter. You can like point it at a service you've written or a website and it'll look for common things like you forgot quotation marks on e-tags or stuff like that. It's really, really good. Uh, I already mentioned his cache tutorial. Definitely worth a look. Charles Proxy, woo. And I understand that most of you guys already use Guzzle. It's kind of the typical thing with Laravel, but Again, really, really awesome thing. It's the only client I know of that supports cache control stuff on your PHP, uh, on your PHP stack. You can actually like pass it a doctor and cache adapter, for example. It's cool. You might have noticed a picture or two of a dog in here. Thank you to these people. And then finally, uh, please leave me feedback on joined in. I'm kind of new to this conference thing, uh, and anything would either like help me get better at it or help me go to the next conference. So again, thank you for your time. Uh, any questions, let me know. Oh, okay. I was going to give you guys a bathroom break, but okay. I'm a little bit too selfish for that. Um, first, uh, thank you. That, that was a really, really good talk. Thank you, sir. Um, and I learned a lot about HP. Actually, I had no idea that stuff existed. Uh, and also, kudos for using dog pictures rather than uh, felines, because I'm kind of sick of them. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've actually got a couple of questions. So, um, 
First and foremost, going back to uh, the accept header uh, that you put through as part of your requests. Mm -hmm. um, if you define an accept header, for example, as application slash JSON, uh, and the server does not actually support that type, that, that header uh, request, mm -hmm. uh, what should the response from the server be? Should it be some kind of 4xx uh, status code? Should it return with the default? Or? Excellent question. Um, I believe it's a 406 not acceptable. There might be a different one, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it, it's a status code called not acceptable and it's for this specific use case. Um, and uh, yeah, so just a couple more. Um, with e-tags, um, what happens in the context of a forced refresh from a browser? Does the browser just not send along an e-tag with that, or how, how, does, how should that be handled? It's a good question, actually. Um, I think it depends on the browser implementation. I mean, you can see that with some uh, browsers, especially older versions, like you had to hit F5 twice or Control F5, and then, you know. So that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, and just one uh, other one as well, uh, a little bit separate from what you've been talking about actually, uh, and something that's I've kind of seen quite a bit is kind of a debate on whether you should be using nested resources for URL requests mm -hmm. or you know kind of really more flat structures. Yep. I'm of the opinion that flat, uh, flat structures are a little bit better, especially seeing as I use Angular quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious how that kind of plays into you know kind of using this kind of unique URL idea that you're you're explaining. Okay. Um, well, like I said, this is an HTTP thing, not a REST thing, but. Um, I would say I would highly recommend looking at something called hypermedia APIs. And one of the things that we're getting with hypermedia APIs is this concept of zoom, where you can like say, I want this resource, but with like this many surrounding resources. You can sort of define how much you want to embed with it. Um, and I think that's really about the contract that you make with your API. And you can sort of adjust based on that. Um, some things like, for example, like how is kind of winning that hypermedia format war. And they have this idea of embedded resources where you say, this is actually a different page, like I have a book, a book has an author, the author is actually over here at this resource, and the book is here. But what I can do is I can actually embed this stuff to save like an extra HTTP lookup, you know, instead of, you know, for performance reasons, basically. Uh, that's that's kind of what I prefer. You do not always get all the cache semantics that way. They're talking about doing it, but I suspect it will probably be, you know, two years before we have the tooling to make that work seamlessly. Nonetheless, I would still say that's the best way to go. The 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 idea of unique URLs, I would highly recommend stress that above everything else. That will, that will simplify all of your other work. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, um, I was wondering what's your preferred technique for uh, client-side uh, caching validation, especially after deployments or changing assets and all that? Um, it's a good question. I think the easiest thing to do at this point is um, I like to just basically freeze them and then change the file name, be that a hash or an ID or something in the URL, right? Uh, then you can just simply slap a, a cache control header on it for that resource and then go for it. Uh, something I didn't mention in the talk and something a lot of people do that's a little bit wrong is they say this is a JavaScript file that will never change because I'm just changing the file, number, uh, file name. But if you do that, then you should make sure you never set the cache control header more than one year in advance. It's tempting to like set it to like 2099, but if you do that and it's more than one year in advance, well, the semantics are undefined and it may just be completely ignored. It's one of the weird spots in the, in the specification. So I would say just change the file name, aesthetic and a lot of the things give you the ability to do that easily, and then set the cache control one year in the future. Yeah, yeah sorry, in case you, you didn't hear, he asked uh, would I go for file name instead of a query parameter. Uh, yes, I would. Uh, the, the rules about query parameters, they're like encoded in the spec, but again, it's something that changes a little bit. I would probably go with the file name just to be sure. Um, the e-tag stuff, as far as I'm aware, browser support is really good, but I didn't know about the precondition thing. Mm -hmm. um, is the browser support just baked in there? You know, when you're modifying, if you're posting a form, does it send the e-tag? How does that work? Well, your browser will send the e-tag uh, always. That's not a problem. The big deal is when you're working with, um, with things like you know, curl, for example, then you have to handle all that yourself. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of web frameworks don't support e-tags. I think Laravel, I saw a, a good article, a blog article about that a couple months ago, and then Rails has it since four. Those are the only two I know with decent e-tag support, actually. So the stuff will be sent for you if it's a browser. Whether or not your, your server actually does anything with it is a different question altogether. But if you're just using standard packages, Apache, whatever, then it should work as intended. And also, when a precondition fails mm -hmm. for updating or deleting something, 
what's the best way to deal with that? You know, if, if you want <laughs> someone to be able to re-edit what they're doing, for instance. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a couple different things. Um, easiest solution, just show it like a generic error message and give them a specific instruction to retry and re-edit the record. And you can tell them, hey, someone else saved it. Uh, depending on how big your, uh, your budget is, then you could also pop up a merge or diff tool or something like that. <laughs> I've never had anyone actually be willing to pay for that, as cool as it sounds. Thank you. I, I came about an article the other day, and it explained that you can use an e-tag as a cookie, as mm -hmm. cookies are not permitted anymore. And I was wondering, uh, is an e-tag always sent along uh, with every file that has been cached by a browser? Well, your your average browser will send e-tags for whatever uh -huh. it has. It, you know, it wants to, to hit the cache if it can. Um, so you, you can use an e-tag in that way. I would argue that it actually doesn't change anything. I know that the cookie law is unpopular at times, mm -hmm. but uh, and it, it, it's, it relies too much on one thing, but I would argue that you're violating the spirit of the law, if not the actual wording. Yeah, I understand, but I, I think some advertising networks yeah. uh, use it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they do do it. It's, it's wrong, but it does work. Okay. You know? Oh, well, that was easy. Thank I have you. a question. Yeah, um, have you run into anything with mobile browsers kind of almost ignoring cache rules at times? There's periods where I, I'll, I'll, a site has been up for a little bit and you load in the browser, in the mobile browser, and it might pull something from a week ago. Yeah. And it's just, I was wondering if you ran into any problems like that. So. I personally haven't, but I can believe that would happen with mobile because of the way they sort of freeze applications in the background. I, I, can, I can see that easily happening. Um, the main issue I've had with some mobile browsers, more, than, more so than cache per se, is that they don't uh, always request or hope for gzip. And so they're much more prone to, because almost everything else wants gzip content nowadays, they're much more prone to sort of getting that lovely white page with strange symbols going all the way down. That happened to somebody I know just a few months ago. That's, that tends to be the main thing, but there's very often a little you can do with a do about it. It's usually a misconfigured ISP upstream cache. Well, thank you very much for your time. I hope you have a great conference. <laughs>